Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to welcome this group. Um, my name is Natasha Bajus Sugiyama. I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at UWM. And um, I, this is a very exciting series that we are very um, happy to be um, putting together um, in collaboration and in co-sponsorship with the JACL Wisconsin chapter, as well as the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee. Um, our focus in the series is to look at the experiences of Japanese Latin Americans during World War II. Um, the series is designed to um, offer some kind of parallel insights about the experiences of Japanese and Japanese Latin Americans and other parts of the Americas um, as a Jewish museum has a fascinating set of exhibits and programs um, here in Milwaukee on the experiences in the United States. So today we welcome um, Dr. Jerry Garcia and I will introduce him in a little bit, but let me first say uh, thank you to our collaborators and uh, Ron Kuramoto of the JCL for helping uh, get our conversations going and doing uh, collaborations together. Um, I also want to encourage you, if you are able, to attend the second and third panels, uh, which are going to be taking place on uh, April 20th uh, with Natasha Werner of Densho Foundation and May 11th uh, with Dr. Jeffrey Lesser uh, at Emory University. Um, so let me say a little bit about logistics before we jump in. Um, we'll have a presentation and then you can put your questions in the chat or we'll certainly give uh, Dr. Garcia time to present uh, some information to us and then we'll have a chance for Q&A afterwards. So with that, let me say a little bit about Dr. Jerry Garcia, who um, I had a chance to speak with a little bit before we started today and has a fascinating story. Um, he's raised in Quincy, Washington to parents who worked in agriculture for most of their lives. And he's a proud child of migrants. And uh, as he puts it, he's a first generation everything. He served for three years in the US Army and began his educational journey uh, as, uh, in that context and then and went on to earn his PhD in Mexican and Chicano history from Washington State University. Um, he held many academic appointments, um, including appointments at Iowa State University, Michigan State University, and he was the director of Chicano education program at Eastern Washington University. And he uh, was called away from academic life to serve in a very interesting organization, which we heard about um, just before the start of this program, which is the CMOD um, health centers, community health centers. And so uh, maybe end of the Q&A. Uh, if we have time, we'll plant the seeds and ask you to say a little bit something about the organization that you're currently at. He's the author of many articles and five books, uh, including one that looks at the experiences of Japanese uh, immigrants to Mexico. And the topic of his talk today will be Inside an Invisible Iron Wall, The Forced Relocation of Japanese and Jap Japanese Mexicans during World War II. So thank you, Dr. Jerry Garcia, for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen now uh, for my PowerPoint presentation. Give me a second here. Are we good? Yes. Awesome. Let me uh, put it in full mode here. There we go. Okay, well, let, let me also uh, do a couple of thank yous to Julie Klein and uh, Natasha Borges Sugiyama for reaching out to me um, and giving me this wonderful opportunity to present essentially what's what's uh, in my book. This is a short version of, of uh, my book, uh, Looking Like the Enemy, uh, that came out in 2014, published by the University of Arizona Press that examines the uh, Japanese uh, movement and settlement in, in Mexico, um, which people still don't know too much about uh, even today. Uh, there hasn't been that much written on, on this uh, topic. Uh, most of the literature that you read on the Japanese experience is usually on the Japanese American experience here in the United States. And, uh, and I think after that, we probably get uh, 
material on Brazil and a little bit more on, on Peru. Uh, but Mexico has kind of been in the shadows um, for, for a little while. And I've been do, trying to do my best to tell a little bit about the experience of the Japanese uh, in Mexico. And so, um, as I mentioned here in my, my first, first slide, uh, I think uh, Natasha already mentioned my, my title, but I definitely want to say you know, thank you again to the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And then uh, you know, the co-sponsors that were mentioned, but I want to mention them again, the Japanese American Citizens League, Wisconsin chapter in the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee. Right? So, so with that, let me begin my, my presentation. And in general, what I want to do is just provide some context because I'm actually going to lead into the Japanese experience, Japanese Mexican experience during World War II. But before I get there, I wanted to give folks a kind of the context about, you know, uh, where was the community at before World War II uh, within Mexico? And it's development, I mean, settlement and development, et cetera. Uh, so I want to give people a, an idea of the Japanese uh, and Japanese Mexican community uh, prior to World War II. And so, um, so I'm also going to right here at the beginning, a couple of slides I'm going to provide just kind of a general overview on the movement of Japanese outside of Japan to various parts of the world, including uh, more broadly Latin America. And then of course I'll get specific and look at uh, Mexico uh, in particular. But uh, <clears throat> I won't bog us down too much on some of these uh, bullet points that I have, but these were some of the uh, kind of causations that, that caused the movement of Japanese <clears throat> outside of Japan. And not just to Latin America, but throughout, throughout the world, right? So the Meiji Restoration, uh, just in a nutshell, in 1868 was Japan's kind of movement towards modernization. And that caused a lot of different issues uh, in Japan. Uh, I think for, for my presentation, it's probably just best to know that because of this modernization movement in the late 19th century, a lot of displacement occurred and disruption occurred, especially in the agriculture communities, the, the, the farmer the farmers throughout Japan. So when you look at the movement of Japanese out of uh, their home country into other places of, of the world, the initial class are gonna be a lot of farmers because they're the ones that are being displaced through this modernization because a lot of their land's being taken up for industry. And so you're gonna see then a lot of farmers uh, leaving Japan to other parts of the world, including Latin America and, and Mexico. And then of course, uh, coalescing at that same time period was Mexico's need for immigrants, right? And so, and all these bullet points here, I go into great detail in my book. And so if, if something kind of sticks out uh, in regards to this, the best place to go to is to, to get the details is, is my book. So the Mexican colonization plans is kind of a complex situation, but in the end, um, there were European groups that went into Mexico, uh, but by the time Mexico began to develop plans to allow immigrants to come in, which was the late 19th century, early 20th century, a lot of Europeans had already gone to other countries, uh, such as the United States, uh, or in, to Argentina and Brazil, et cetera. So Mexico then wasn't able to take advantage of European immigration like these other countries, and in the end, uh, decided to invite uh, Asian groups. And the two major Asian groups, I actually say three, the, th the three major Asian groups that would initially go into Mexico would be uh, the Chinese, the Japanese, and then to a lesser extent, uh, Koreans, okay? And then the third bullet point there, the Inamoto colony. The, the name Inamoto is, is the, names, the, the namesake of uh, ex rear admiral who started this uh, Japanese colony in Mexico in 1897. So he essentially funded it. And so he's kind of given the honor of being the, the first individual sponsor uh, Japanese immigration to Mexico. And if you look at the date there, 1897, it's actually considered the first movement of Japanese into what we call today Latin America. Right? Now there had been movement of Japanese into the Americas before 1897, but not as immigrants, just as tourists, you know, people visiting, returning back to Japan. But this is the first concerted effort uh, of a Japanese colony to settle permanently in the in the um, in the Americas, and so and of course the the other unusual thing is that they chose Chiapas uh, in southern Mexico as their uh, place of choice uh, for a variety of different reasons. But the main one was 
the promise of growing coffee uh, in that region, which is still abundant today. And so the Inamota colony then is kind of our first ground zero location for Japanese uh, in Mexico and in Latin America in general. Then after 1897, you'll see Japanese moving into Mexico in a variety of different places, but also throughout Latin America. Uh, the places such as Brazil and Peru and places in Central America, Cuba, they will all begin to see the movement of Japanese in different numbers, of course. Um, the largest population will be in Brazil, uh, followed by Peru, and then uh, Mexico. And then, of course, they, the numbers drop dramatically after those three countries. Uh, and then, of course, if we were to look at the whole hemisphere, the United States would come into play. So would Canada, uh, for that matter. Okay, so, so just a quick point here to, to reinforce Chiapas, Mexico, 1897 was the first location Japanese came in what we call today Latin America. Uh, and the first established settlement was uh, by, the, by the Inamoto colony. This would come into play, kind of remember this a little bit, uh, because when we get to the World War II time period, uh, the descendants of the Inamoto colony uh, will benefit from this uh, history during World War II. So then Japanese movement beyond Chiapas occurs in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and you can literally think of literally every, every location or region of Mexico uh, but primarily the border region and in Baja California, those will be the largest concentration of Japanese uh, in Mexico leading up to the outbreak of uh, World War II. And then uh, this last bullet point, again, this is uh, pretty important to remember, but because of time, I don't have a, a lot of time to go into detail. And so what I want to briefly say is this is that when we look at the Japanese in the Western Hemisphere, their treatment is going to be predi predicated on how Asian groups have been treated in the United States, uh, especially the Chinese and then the Japanese. And so, uh, so hopefully we're all kind of have a general, general historical background, at least a basic one in regards to the treatment of uh, ethnic groups in general, but in particular Asian Americans in the United States, which is not a very good chapter in US history. And so, so understand that long before World War II breaks out, um, the Japanese had long before had already been reconfigured or racialized uh, in the Americas and especially in the United States. And the United States will spread this um, anti-Japanese sentiment throughout the Americas as early as the uh, early part of the 20th century. So by the time we get to the World War II time period, the late 1930s, uh, 1940s, the Japanese had already been reconfigured as the enemy uh, long before World War II breaks out. So, so this is important to understand the treatment of Japanese uh, in general in the, in the hemisphere, but in particular, what's going to happen to them during World War II. And so here's a map just to kind of give you a, a sense of where the Japanese are coming from. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see this, but just pay attention to the darker shades. Uh, the darker the shade, the higher number of Japanese that are moving out of Japan to other places of the world. Um, and of course, uh, when you look at these locations, one of the things they have in common is the high concentration of farmers who have been displaced. Right? So these are large farming regions uh, throughout, throughout Japan. and the, and in the darker the region, you have 10,000 or more Japanese leaving uh, those, those regions. And again, this is throughout the world, not just uh, Latin America. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Japanese in Latin America uh, are going to be in many, many different locations throughout the, throughout the Western Hemisphere, um, including Mexico, Peru, Brazil, uh, Honduras, you know, Central America in general, Cuba, Argentina, uh, Chile. Uh, but they'll vary in numbers. Uh, as I mentioned, um, in Mexico, you know, doing my research before World War II, I was able to determine that there were roughly nearly 20,000 Japanese in Mexico before the outbreak of World War II. Uh, in Brazil, uh, probably close to 300, 300 to 400,000. So the largest concentration uh, in the whole Western Hemisphere, followed by Peru. And then the other countries, some will just number uh, in the, in the uh, double digits or several hundred, right? So it just, it just depends on what country you're looking at 
in regards to uh, determining how many Japanese are in a particular region. But the if we look at the whole West, Western Hemisphere, there is kind of like a top five, and that would be, you know, Brazil, uh, the United States, uh, Peru, Mexico, uh, Canada. Uh, those would be the, the kind of the largest uh, Western Hemispheric countries that would have significant numbers of, of Japanese. And this is important because no matter where you're at in the Western Hemisphere at the outbreak of World War II, they are going to be targeted, uh, regardless of what country they're going to be in. However, having said that, uh, different countries will take different approaches in regards to how they're going to treat their Japanese. Uh, for example, my, in my case, uh, Mexico, how they're going to treat their Japanese Mexicans uh, versus, for example, our, our kind of template is how the United States treated the Japanese Americans, which is, which is pretty horrible. Right? So we always kind of use that as our gauge. And how did, for example, Mexico treat the Japanese in comparison to the United States? Or how did Brazil treat their Japanese Brazilians in comparison to Japanese Americans, et cetera. Okay, so I'll talk about that in a little bit. And so here there's a general map uh, of uh, you know, states and, and uh, regions where Japanese went to. And you can see literally by the time we get to the 1930s, 1940s, you can find Japanese in various numbers throughout, throughout the country. Okay. And this is actually a photograph, right? a, a copy of a photograph of the Inamoto colony, the first colonists arriving uh, in what was known as Puerto San Benito, but it's today called Puerto Madero after the, after the former president on uh, May 11th, uh, 1897. So this is actually their, uh, them uh, leaving their ship and coming, coming on shore in, in, in Chiapas. So a very historical uh, photograph. And then here's here's a little bit. I'm kind of getting into a little bit about the uh, the settle, settle, settling out of the Japanese. Uh, this photograph here is of the descendants, uh, roughly about you know three to four decades after the Inamoto colony was established. Uh, these are descendants of that. You can see the photo was taken in the 1930s. Uh, so uh, what I want to do is give the the audience here at least a little taste of uh, not only the settling out but also the uh, assimilation and accommodation that Japanese are going to make uh, when uh, arriving in Japan. Right? They'll adopt many Mexican customs, but also maintain a lot of their original culture. And I'll show you some images uh, of that. So again, early, uh, early uh, immigration into, into Mexico. And one of the things, I mean, if you're, if you're a uh, connoisseur or a if you understand Mexican history a little bit and you look at some of these images and time periods, uh, you'll understand uh, a lot about uh, the Japanese experience. And so one of the things that I cover in my book, uh, for example, when we're looking at the Japanese moving to Mexico, we're really talking about these important, very important benchmarks in Mexican history simultaneously. For example, the Mexican Revolution is, is, uh, is ongoing with the significant movement of Japanese into Mexico. All right, so, you know, for example, this uh, picture on the right, where it says early Japanese immigration who worked at the mine of Cananea in Sonora, Mexico. So if you look at the time period uh, and, you, and you recognize that uh, mining company's name, you understand that that was, that was the location that many Mexican historians point to as the spark for the Mexican Revolution. Because there was a major strike there uh, in 1910 that helped spark the Mexican Revolution. And the Japanese were there. They were, they were actually workers, uh, coal miners during this time period. And so that's what I found very interesting as I was doing my research is that initially, you know, what stood out was you recognize as a Mexican historian, I recognize a lot of this Mexican history right away. But in the background, I would notice Japanese. And so I, I started kind of connecting the dots, you know, looking at this history. Right? And so, uh, but I also got, you know, I also got a very interesting story about how I got, uh, into this project to begin with. Uh, I think as Natasha mentioned, I spent three years in the military right out of high school. And I spent the whole time in Japan. And so it was, it was at that time when I was about 18 years old that a uh, Japanese person that I became friends with uh, told me that, that Japanese had gone to Mexico. And of course, at that age, you know, I pretty much went in one ear and out the other. Uh, I wasn't uh, too much concerned about Japanese movement to anywhere in the world at that, at that point in my life. 
but it's something that I never forgot. Uh, and when I got when I went to graduate school, it was all resurrected through a class that I took on the Mexican Revolution. So, so there's a huge connection in regards to my military experience in Japan and what eventually became my my dissertation and my and essentially my first uh, my first book on the Japanese of Mexico. Uh, again, here some more additional images from the 20s and 30s um, in Tijuana. Uh, these are you know Mexican Mexican Japanese celebrating uh, Mexican holidays, uh, also assimilating into Mexican Mexican culture. Uh, one of the th I'm going to show you an image here of a registration card for Japanese coming into Mexico, and I'll kind of give you an idea of what the Japanese did when they came into Mexico uh, in this time period. But the point I'm kind of driving with these images is some of their assimilation. Here's a here's one of my favorite pictures. I'm not sure, I can't remember if this is in my book or not, but I should have put it in there. So first of all, I, I use this image for two reasons. One, the uh, uh, kind of the transculturation of Japanese culture into Mexico, right? And this, these are sumo wrestlers, right? But, but they're the smallest sumo wrestlers I've ever seen in my life, right? And so, and so I find it kind of an amusing picture, but it's also an important picture because it shows us that even though Japanese began to assimilate and adopt Mexican culture and customs, they also tried to maintain some of their own uh, culture and customs from their place of origin. And this is a great image to display that in regards to trying to keep sumo uh, wrestling alive and well while they're in, uh, in Mexico. So here's a card I was talking about. So one of the things that uh, we'll see right away uh, with the Japanese coming in, and, and these are registration cards for Japanese nationals coming into the country. And I found about 3,000 of these cards at the National Archives. And it's just a, a wealth of information uh, in each one of these cards, because it obviously tells us the person's name, their age, their marital status, where they came from in Japan, where they're settling out in Mexico, their occupation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you can go back on that. So just a tremendous amount of wealth of information. But one of the things that you're going to see, I think this happens in a lot of places, especially in the United States, is a lot of the Japanese will adopt uh, Mexican names, right? So they'll, they'll change their, their, their family name into a uh, Mexican surname. And you'll see that over and over and over again as part of this assimilation process that we'll see uh, throughout uh, the history of the Japanese in Mexico in the first part of the 20th. 20th century. So these cards were just a wealth of information that I was able to use uh, in my book to garner uh, a lot of info about the original Japanese that came in. Right. So let me, uh, let me pause here because I'm transitioning now closer to World War II. Um, so as we know, World War II breaks out other places in the world besides, before the United States or Mexico enter it in 41 and 42 respectively. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, the United States had already reconfigured uh, the Chinese and Japanese uh, Americans. And a lot of that filtered into the rest of the Americas, Latin America uh, in particular. So the United States then had kind of a, a major head start in regards to creating what, we, what I call the you know, first part of the title of my book, uh, Looking Like the Enemy. The uh, United States had essentially had already achieved this goal long before World War II had broken out. Uh, but when World War II breaks out, the United States creates this massive propaganda campaign uh, through the office. This is an actual government office that was created for propaganda purposes through the US government known as the Office of Inter-American Affairs. And for my particular study and my research, there were two uh, major kind of magazines that were created specifically to aid the United States in its propaganda efforts especially against the Axis powers. And one is called the Inter-American Monthly. Uh, and the other one, it was a Spanish version of this called En Guardia. And so it, these two, uh, not only these two, but this is, these are two of the um, apparatuses the United States used uh, to help uh, fight the war at the propaganda level. And of course, when you go through a lot of these issues, what they're really doing is providing a lot of uh, information about the dangers of the Japanese uh, in Latin America, the dangers of the Germans in Latin America and the dangers of Italians, so the Axis powers, right? And, but there are also books and also reporters and journalists that were hired by the US government uh, to go out and create false narratives of the Japanese population in Latin America. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of that. 
right? But this is this is all be, being done in order to turn the uh, native populations of Mexico, right? The Mexican the nationals of Mexico against the Japanese uh, by using these kind of false narratives about the, the Japanese uh, in Mexico, just like it was done here in the United States. You know, all the Japanese in, uh, in the United States were rounded up under false pretenses that there were a, a security threat. And in, in the end, we know that was never the case. Well, the same thing was happening in, in Mexico. And we also have to remember that during this time period, the United States wielded a tremendous amount of power militarily and economically throughout Latin America. And so this is why in the end, a lot of Latin American countries would follow the United States primarily based on the economic advantages they would receive uh, by, for example, rounding up their own Japanese and incarcerating them, okay? So this magazine then was used um, as a propaganda machine against the various Axis powers, but in particular, the Japanese. And so here's an example uh, from the, uh, another example from the Inter-American magazine, right? Uh, in which uh, journalists uh, and photographers would go into Mexico. And, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you just, I'll be very transparent about this. When you look at these images, all they are are photographers taking a picture of a business that has a Japanese name and Japanese barbers, and then writing up a story that these are not actually barbers, they're actually spies in disguise as barbers, right? With no proof whatsoever, not, nothing, right? So this is this, you know, there's an old saying in, during World War time period uh, that was very, very relevant throughout Mexico and Latin America, that every, every Japanese was a spy, right? Irregardless, and that was the, that was the position that the United States took uh, in every uh, Latin American country. That no matter how innocent a Japanese might be, they were still a potential spy against the United States. And so here's a perfect example, right out of the Inter American Monthly, of just of a Japanese-owned business and a barbershop, and then being accused of being spies just because of their ethnicity, right? So that what so so in my book, then I go into great detail about this idea of how the Japanese had been racialized throughout the Americas based on the racialization in the United States. And here's a, a continuation of that. So the racialization of the Japanese and Mexican indigenous population. So in this picture here, uh, I got this image in my book and I explain it in detail, but the, the actual Japanese national in this picture is the one in the middle. That's actually a captain that was captured by the, by the Mexico and US governments and incarcerated. But the, two, but the two on the left and the right are actually indigenous people uh, from Mexico, from, from various indigenous tribes. But what they're saying in this photograph, right, is that uh, because of the resemblance of indigenous people to Asians, that we don't know if an indigenous person could be a spy, right, disguised as an indigenous person, a Japanese disguised as an indigenous person. So, so again, this kind of just reinforces this idea of this racialization, now not only of the Japanese, but now the indigenous population, right? So these are the kind of, uh, and again, when you read this material, uh, they provide no proof whatsoever of any of this. It's just all propaganda being, being used in order to instill fear. I mean, that's the whole, whole reason why we see not only these magazines, but also a book uh, that I, that I um, prominently exhibit in my, in my own book uh, by, a, by a journalist by the name of Betty Kirk. And she was actually a, an employee of the Office of Inter-American Affairs, whose job was to go out and write a book about the dangers of the Japanese in Mexico and Latin America. Uh, and of course, this is uh, what is occurring. And this is what's, this is what's driving uh, the fear in regards to the Japanese populations throughout Latin America, and in my case, Mexico. Uh, and then the repercussions, of course, is going to be uh, their uprooting and displacement and incarceration. And then of course, children were not left out, right? So this is, a, this is actually from Brazil. Uh, I couldn't find a picture like this in Mexico, but I found a picture like this. And this is again, out of the Inter-American Monthly. So the same journalists then began to reconfigure children in the same way. And what they're doing in these, in these images here is saying that every Japanese school in Latin America are actually uh, indoctrination schools to turn, to turn Japanese children uh, against democracy, against the United States, against Brazil, against Mexico, whatever country they exist in, these schools are not active schools where they're learning 
write reading, writing, and arithmetic, but they're actually being indoctrinated uh, in regards to the uh, 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 doctrine of the of Japan and the emperor, right? Which of course is uh, there's no no truth to that at all uh, in regards to that. These are just the, actually when you look at these pictures, they're actually just pictures of Japanese school children in Brazil in a classroom, uh, but they're the story then the narrative is created to show that the indoctrination of Japanese and the Americas against the United States happens at a very young age. But as I mentioned, there's, there's no truth to that. But this is the propaganda campaign that is ongoing that is gonna have a detrimental effect on the Japanese population uh, throughout the Americas. And so here, here are the two magazines. Um, as you can see, you know, quote unquote, Jap threat to Latin America from the Inter-American Monthly. And then the Spanish version, because a lot of people in Latin America were not English speakers. And the, the Inter-American Monthly was made for primarily US English speakers. But in Wadia, the picture on the right, which is identical to the, to the English version, was the Spanish version of the Inter-American Monthly. Right? So, so Spanish people could also be uh, used in regards to this propaganda. Right. And so again, I'm only kind of touching the tip of the iceberg. When you look at, for example, if there are any, any students out there or any professors looking for projects for your students, there hasn't been an exhaustive study on the Office of Inter-American Affairs, but uh, the information I gathered is, uh, again, I, this is just the tip of the iceberg in regards to what I use in my book and in my presentations. But uh, the Inter-American, the Office of Inter-American Inter Affairs went well beyond magazines. I mean, they actually created films uh, in regards to propaganda throughout Latin America. And so there's a, a vast uh, amount of information and, and, and knowledge that still needs to be extracted from this particular agency to tell, tell a full picture of the US efforts uh, in Latin America in regards to the Japanese. And then I use this, let me explain this image here a little bit. So this is actually from the United States. Maybe some of you might have seen something like this or maybe this actual picture. This is taken, I think it's out of the LA Times. Um, it's anti-Japanese nationalistic fervor in the US. And so again, I'm just gonna read in quotations, quote, Japs keep moving. This is a white man's neighborhood. So this should, this should sound very familiar to us, those of us that were raised in, and uh, educated here in the United States, because this was, uh, you know, well, um, this kind of propaganda, this kind of sentiment uh, was well known uh, leading up to World War II and during World War II. Okay. And we can go on quite a bit about this image, but the point I raise it up is this, is um, in all my research on Mexico and in Latin America in general on the Japanese, I have never come across an image like this uh, in Spanish or in English in Latin America. Now, it doesn't mean that, that one does not exist like this, nor it doesn't mean that there wasn't this kind of sentiment because there certainly was, right? It's just that I could never find an image like this, which I think tells us something and there is something to say about this because when we look at uh, Mexico and uh, let's just use, for example, December 7th, 1941, which is the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And this is where a lot of this fervor really took, took it to a different level, this anti-Japanese fervor an anti-Asian sentiment uh, went to another level after, after December 7th, 1941, right? And this is, you know, this is an image from post-1941, post right? And so when we look at Mexico during this time period, one of the things that I've come across in my research is that the, the Mexicans in particular were not overly concerned about December 7th, 1941, right? Why? Because it wasn't their country that got bombed, right? It wasn't their Navy that, that got bombed. And they weren't part of the allied powers yet, right? And so, so the, the Mexican population in general did not exhibit this kind of anti-Japanese sentiment uh, initially, okay? Now there would be some later on, right? Now, let me backtrack just a little bit. There is a group in Mexico that did receive this kind of anti-Asian sentiment and those were the Chinese. You know, Chinese were treated, uh, you know, when we compare the Japanese and the Chinese in Mexico, there's no doubt when we look at the Chinese, it's a whole different uh, uh, ball field for them. Uh, some of you might know, I mean, 
What is considered today the largest massacre of Chinese in the Americas happened in Mexico, in Torreon, uh, Mexico, right? 300 Japanese were massacred in the early part of the 20th century just for being Chinese, right? So, so the Chinese then, and there's been a lot written about uh, the Chinese in Mexico. Uh, and so, so they really felt the, the full blunt of anti-Asian sentiment uh, in Mexico. Now the Japanese, there was also uh, anti-Japanese sentiment uh, throughout Mexico, but not to the level that you see against the Chinese. And in my book, I go into some detail about this, and I'll give you a couple of examples of, of, of why uh, that was here, here in a moment. So again, I, I use this, again, this is the United States, but I use it as a comparison to what we're going to see in Mexico. So we know in the United States, so we know in the United States, uh, there are these uh, massive roundups uh, then uh, Japanese Americans sent to assembly centers, then eventually uh, to internment camps. And this is just a, an image of, of the assembly centers and internment camps and the exclusion zone uh, in the United States. And there were other camps. For example, what's not, what's not listed on here are the international internment, internment camps uh, that are located, uh, I think one was located in Montana uh, and some on the East Coast. Uh, but these are the ones that we're most familiar with from our U.S. U.S. history. And so I think, I think most of us have seen a map similar to this. So then when we look at, when we look at the Japanese experience in World War II, um, the Japanese had a very different experience leading up to World War II. Uh, in fact, when you look at the overall experience, um, there's really not too much difference between the Japanese, uh, Japanese immigrant experience in Mexico vis-a-vis -vis any other immigrant group coming into Mexico, right? Um, there are many reasons, and uh, you know the Mexican reaction. I already mentioned a little bit about that, uh, but there was a kind of U.S. and Mexican propaganda blitz, and the reason for this was because for the Mexican population, they were lukewarm to World War II. You know, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, you know, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm by the Mexican population to get involved with World War II. So this is one of the reasons why Mexico and the United States together went on this propaganda blitz to get the, to get the country mobilized, at least mentally, to enter the war. Because Mexico would not enter the war until, until May of 1942, right? a good six or seven months after the, United, after the United States, and only after a Mexican ship was bombed by, by the Germans. And so, um, So let me give you a couple of differences that we're going to see in regards to the treatment of Japanese Mexicans versus Japanese Americans. So first of all, uh, I don't like this. I don't like to split hairs. You know, I want to. I want to be very careful about this. Is that when we begin to look at, say, Mexico and the United States and try to argue which place was better for a Japanese? Well, neither place was better. Right? Both places was pretty pretty horrible because, in the end, whether you're talking about Japanese Mexicans or Japanese Americans. What's going to happen to both populations is they're going to be uprooted and displaced uh, from the, from their from their homes, right? The overwhelming majority of the Japanese that are going to be put into uh, internment camps in Mexico are going to come from uh, the northern region of Mexico and Baja California on the west coast, because those were by this time period, 1930s, 1940s, those were the major populations of Japanese in Mexico, right? And so, so unlike the United States, though. As I mentioned in my previous slide, there, there, there were not going to be any assembly centers, nor were there going to be any roundups you know, by, by the U.S. military, right? marching um, Japanese Mexicans to a railroad uh, system and putting them in on, on railroad tracks and sending them to internment camps. You'll see none of that in Mexico. Right? So this is kind of a different approach that Mexico took. Now, the United States wanted Mexico to take a similar approach. Uh, in fact, um, there's a letter I found, in fact, it's in my book, I'm, I'm going to kind of paraphrase it, that the, uh, the State Department of the United States, after December uh, 7th, 1941, sent out a uh, telegram to all Latin American uh, nations saying that they need to round up all their Japanese and follow the U.S. in regards to incarcerating them. And that if they didn't want to do it, they were to round up those Japanese and send them to the United States. And the United States would do that for them. Right. The only country that took took United States up on that was Peru. 
So Peru rounded up literally almost all of their Japanese and sent them to Crystal City, Texas. But the other Latin American countries took, took a different approach. I'm gonna speak primarily of, of Mexico. So Mexico then, what it did is it told the Japanese that they had to move on their own out of the um, exclusion zone, which was the West Coast, and into two cities. And that was Guadalajara and Mexico City. So those are the two cities then that Japanese and Japanese Mexicans were forced to, to move into. Right? And they had to do it on their own. Right? And this is where it gets a little kind of haphazard for the Mexican, Mexican government because there is no real direction. The, um, you know, communities obviously are keeping watch on the Japanese population and making sure that they're leaving and making their way to Guadalajara and Mexico City. But it's not being done by a military convoy. It's not being done by government officials. It's just, it's voluntary, right? These Japanese are voluntarily moving from these places uh, into what I call internment cities, Guadalajara, Mexico City. Okay. Now you see, I think it's bullet four or five there where it says internment resistance negotiation. So we can't look at Latin America in general, but in particular Mexico, the same way we look at the United States during this time period. Because Mexican, uh, Mexican politics and Mexican government was very different than the US, even though there were democracies, but there were very different types of democracies. Uh, leading up to World War II, you still, you still had a lot of parts of Mexico that were still run by and large by uh, what we call uh, politicos or caciques, right? Or, or political chiefs. They had a tremendous amount of power uh, in their little area of Mexico or state of Mexico. Right. And the best example, and coming back to Chiapas, our best example of this is Chiapas, uh, where we had the Inamota colony, the, the kind of ground zero of where Japanese went to uh, uh, originally. Right. And there were descendants there, hundreds and hundreds of descendants of the Japanese Inamota colony still living in Chiapas by the time World War II breaks out. And the governor there wrote to the president of Mexico and told him that none of his Japanese were going to be displaced or uprooted and forced to move to Guadalajara at Mexico City, that he would take full responsibility for his Japanese living in his state, right? And he lists a, a number of different rationalizations, but the primary reason that he lists is because of their contributions to the development of Chiapas, right? And that being ground zero for the movement of Japanese to the Americas, right? And so a, a large number, I mean, I would say 99% of all the Japanese Mexican Chiapas did not have to move to Guadalajara or Mexico City based on their history with that state and of course the position that the uh, governor took uh, uh, doing that. Now imagine the governor of California doing something like that. I mean he would, he would be arrested that same day uh, for trying to, uh, to do something like that in the United States. So, so again very very different in regards to Mexico. Now that doesn't mean again getting back to this idea that we get on a slippery slope uh, when we try to think about which place was better because in the end we got uh, tens of thousands of Japanese Mexicans being displaced and more importantly, losing their livelihood. Uh, you know, most of them were farmers, independent farmers, and they, they all lost their land. They all lost their, their, their homes uh, and their livelihood, very similar to the Japanese Americans. And so that's one thing that we can never forget. We have tens of thousands of Japanese Mexicans who are uh, in a very similar situation as Japanese Americans. There's only a slight little difference. Okay, and then uh, haciendas, penal colonies, Comité Ayuda Japonés Mucho, a Japanese Mucho Aid Committee. Uh, these are all elements that are going to come into play in regards to the treatment of Japanese in Mexico during World War World War II. Okay, so here's just a map. One of the things that uh, I was able to find in the U.S. archives in, in Washington D.C. was this uh, huge book a plan that was created by the U.S. military on um, going to war with Japan uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and they did, they did all these calculations about the number of Japanese in Mexico and Latin America in general. So it's just a huge playbook that was created by the US military in the, in the chance that the United States was fighting Japan in the Western Hemisphere, which of course never came to fruition, but there was a plan put in place. And as you can see here, these numbers were pretty off. Uh, this one here says a total number of Japanese in Mexico, uh, 4,136, which the actual number 
was nearly 20,000. But what they didn't do here is count Japanese Mexicans, the offspring of, of the Japanese descendants. And so um, in, in my research, I was able to find all those numbers going through a variety of archives. So here then, you know, we did have, you know, we did have some prominent Japanese arrested and interrogated and incarcerated. Uh, here is one of the most uh, famous individuals, a physician who was uh, charged with espionage in Mexico, uh, Dr. Uh, T. Hasegawa. Uh, this is here, these are stage photos after the fact. So he actually had been, had been uh, photographed, I mean, arrested, interrogated and, and incarcerated. But then the Japanese, I mean, the Japanese, the Mexicans then recreated that whole thing and took photographs. And so these are stage photographs of what actually took place uh, long before these images were taken. But this was Mexico's, so again, Mexico was um, enthusiastic to show the United States that they were doing their part for the war effort. Uh, and this is why they staged these photographs uh, after the fact uh, when uh, Dr. Hasegawa was, was arrested and, and interrogated. And you got a handful of these kinds of situations occurring uh, throughout Mexico. And then, of course, here are Jerry. The... I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. This is fascinating. I want to make sure we have time for our audience to ask ask okay. a few questions. I lost track of so time. So I'm wondering if you can um, wrap up a little bit and describe your your slide, and then um, offer yeah. any concluding thoughts. Yeah, I can conclude right here with this with this image. So so in the end, then this is really kind of the uh, what I what I you know what I consider kind of the fascinating part of the the Japanese Mexican situation is that on the one hand, this map shows penal colonies where, where Japanese, Japanese nationals and Mexicans were detained, but it also sh shows you what I call hacienda internment camps. So what a lot of Japanese did, especially the ones that were very well off the elite Japanese, is that in order to prevent them from becoming incarcerated in American style internment camps, what they decided to do with the, with the permission of the Mexican government was they bought these ex haciendas. And these ex haciendas, they, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, they incarcerated themselves, right? But at but the same time, they were protecting their community, right? And on these ex haciendas, they became kind of co ops where they grew their own food. They protected the Japanese from the harsh realities of the, of the war effort. And so it's kind of like cocooning themselves. So you had kind of like two or three different levels of incarceration. You had penal colonies where they sent people who were considered uh, spies uh, for the Axis powers. Uh, you had detention centers where Japanese were detained. Uh, then you had these in hacienda internment camps where you had the highest numbers of Japanese. And these Japanese at these hacienda internment camps couldn't leave the Guadalajara or Mexico City at any time they wanted. Because in those cities, they were free to, to do whatever they wanted, you know, to find jobs, to live whoever they want, but they had to remain in those cities or in these hacienda internment camps. So in the end, then, uh, there's a little bit of a difference between the Japanese experience and US and the Mexican, the Japanese Mexicans of Mexico, uh, but it's a very thin line in regards to that experience. So, so then um, I'll end here because uh, as Natasha mentioned, we wanna leave a little bit of time for some questions. And so, uh, again, thank you very much for being patient with me. You know, of course, I love talking about this topic, but uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that, that folks might have. Thank you so much. This is just a totally stimulating uh, presentation and so informative. We have a couple of questions in the chat. If you have questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I don't know that we have a raise hands feature, but uh, if we do, please feel free to do that too, as well. Um, some questions came up and they were a little bit uh, factual having to do with whether or not there's still an association of uh, Mexico, Japan, uh, Mexico, Japonesa. And if you could describe a little bit about what Mexico's um, involvement during World War II in terms of its military involvement. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me address that last one. So, um... There wasn't a huge uh, Mexican military involvement. Uh, one of the things that's documented very well is a squadron of Mexican pilots that fought uh, in Asia, uh, primarily in, in the Philippines. Uh, but Mexico's major contribution are really two, two different ways. One is the petroleum 
because Mexico is a oil producer. And so United States and Mexico came to an agreement in regards to uh, tapping into Mexico's oil reserves for the war effort. Uh, and then of course, uh, the major contribution uh, are the Mexican laborers that were sent to the United States to work in the United States, primarily in two industries. That was in the agriculture industry and the railroad industry. So the military contribution was somewhat limited, um, but in regards to uh, human capital and uh, uh, war materials, it was huge. You know, Mexico provided a tremendous amount of war materials above and beyond oil. Uh, what was that first part of the question, uh, Natasha? Um, if there's still an association of uh, yeah, Asociación Mexico Japonesa. Yeah, yeah, I got a picture of that actually. Let me fast forward here. Yeah, there is actually, and that's actually one of the things that existed before the uh, the war, but it was disbanded during the war by the Mexican government, uh, and then uh, reconstituted uh, after World War II in the 1950s. Um, and so Mexico paid uh, a very small amount of reparations. I think it was about 750,000 pesos, but it was to the whole community in Japan, not just to one individual. And so with that money, it was matched by Japanese businessmen. And with that match, they created this facility uh, in Mexico City, uh, the Japanese uh, association that is still in existence. And in fact, I got some of my images uh, from, this, uh, from this location. And so it's, uh, it's still around, still does a lot of uh, promotion, uh, a lot of celebrations. And so it's still an important association. It was very, very important in the first half of the 20th century. In fact, this is how, uh, through this organization, many Japanese got their start in Mexico was through the help of this association in the early part of the 20th century. But it was also labeled during World War II a, uh, a um, potential uh, threat to Mexico. So that's why it was disbanded. But it was uh, you know, recreated under the radar at the Hacienda de Mexico. That I didn't get a chance to show an image of that, but it, it was uh, it was recreated in the shadows in this internment camp by the Japanese, and then uh, was reconstituted after the war. Um, if I may take the the prerogative of the moderator, can you tell us a little bit about what happens after the war, and do um, Japanese Mexicans? go back to where they were previously? Do they return to Baja California or do they stay in Mexico City and Guadalajara um, near the yeses that they had established? How does that, yeah. that story and that trajectory for them um, unfold? Yeah, there's, that's a good question. There's still a lot of research to be done on that aspect, but I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of the Japanese that were sent to Guadalajara and Mexico City remained there. Uh, they never returned back to their place of origin uh, in fact, because they had lost, you know, they, they had lost all their land and their, and their homes, and that was never given back to them. So that's why, uh, you know, not too long ago, I was, I was uh, reached out to uh, in regards to a class action lawsuit for reparations in Mexico for the Japanese community. Uh, but I never heard back. I, I was just, uh, I responded to one email, of course, in the affirmative that I would help out as much as I could. Then I, I never heard back. But yeah, but, you know, when we talk about reparations for the Japanese uh, in Mexico, that's really never been achieved uh, because I don't really consider the 750,000 pesos that was provided by the Mexican government. Um, I really don't consider that reparations because it wasn't for the individual Japanese, but for the community throughout Mexico. And it went specifically for this facility here in Mexico City, which is useful, but we're talking about individual lives that were disrupted. And so, so what occurs in Mexico City and Guadalajara is that a lot of these Japanese that ended up going there ended up creating their own businesses. Uh, small businesses became entrepreneurs uh, in, in these respective cities and just remained there. So that's why today these, these two places remain uh, the largest concentration of Japanese now in the current period in Mexico is Guadalajara and Mexico City. Where before it was Baja California and the northern regions of, of Mexico. So it's kind of, it, it's changed dramatically uh, to now include these two cities where they were in turn at the citywide level. And they just, they just remained there uh, for the durations of, of, of their lives and their families and descendants continue to live 
in these locations. And of course, Chiapas. We can't forget about Chiapas. Chiapas has a sizable Japanese uh, Mexican population because of its, uh, its origins and history. Okay, there are so many great questions and I see a hand up. Um, let me just, I think on, on this point, a couple of questions came up about how many descendants are currently in Mexico, um, if people stayed in Mexico and uh, whether the haciendas are still um, in running and buildings remain. Yeah, so there are, in my last count about 30, about 10 years ago, there were about uh, 30 to 40,000 people of Japanese descent in, in Mexico, which is not huge, but you know, it's, it's still a significant number, uh, but it hasn't grown dramatically uh, because essentially World War II stopped the movement of Japanese immigration and it really never returned to what it was before World War II. So that's why we never saw the Japanese population really climb beyond its original numbers. And then it, it has grown just because of through natural reproduction of the Japanese, Japanese Mexican population. Uh, in Mexico. So I would say between 30 and 40,000 in 2022. Um, now the, uh, I'm going to show you the most famous hacienda. Let me get back to it here real quick. As you can see, I, I skipped a handful of slides here because of time constraints. Actually, I think it was, I'm going the wrong direction. Sorry about that. But yeah, the, the most famous internment camp was called Ex Hacienda de Mexico. Uh, located in Morelia. And this was bought um, by some very famous Japanese businessmen. So here's an image of the Japanese interned on the right and the image in a contemporary period on the left. Those are children and their parents uh, interned in this hacienda. And so today it's an aquatic center, which is very strange. In fact, when you, when you look up this uh, aquatic center, there's no mention of what it used to be. Right, it's, it's, so it's like they they've hidden the past. They don't want to they don't want to uh, know that this used to be an internment camp for Japanese during World War II. So they turned it into an aquatic water park, uh, and, and this is what it looks like today. Right, so very kind of unusual situation in in Mexico. So I, I write about this a little bit in my book that uh, it's in, in, you know from my perspective it's it's the uh, Mexico's way of trying to forget. Uh, what occurred to the Japanese in, in Mexico. And so. Okay. I have a, a hand up from Michael Goodman, who's been waiting. Michael, okay. Do you have a quick question for us? Yeah, uh, it's a very quick question. I was just interested in knowing if there were st was still a Japanese community or settlement on this, uh, on the Isla de Tres Marias off the coast. Right, right. Uh, that's the one down there um, off the coast of Cancun, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, there is a small population there. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't had, had that question come up for a very long time. There is a small population. Uh, you know, last time I went, there was a great Japanese restaurant <laughs> that I went to. So, uh, but it's not it's not huge, but definitely uh, the, the, some descendants still live on the island there. It's okay, a thanks. you probably know. I mean, I'm not sure if you've been there, uh, Michael but it's a huge tourist attraction in the contemporary period. Well, I know Cancun is. I was asking the Isla de Tres Marias, yeah. which was off in the Pacific somewhere. Well, the one I'm thinking of, the, I mean, the one that I'm familiar with, I, I could have swore it has the same name, the Isla. Um, okay, we're probably talking about two different islands. You're, I'm, I'm thinking of the one in the Atlantic off the coast okay. of Cancun. And so, yeah, I think the one you're thinking of is actually... It's on my map that I had up earlier. Uh, yeah, on that one there, Michael, I couldn't tell you for sure if there are any Japanese descendants. I know there are Japanese interned there during the uh -huh. war, but I'm not sure if there's still Japanese living on that island. Uh, yeah, so if you, I, mean, I can't, you can't see this, but yeah, if you look at, uh, I'm trying to put my cursor up here. This is the island you're talking about right here. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so as you can see, the number of Japanese in turn there was r relatively small. I think I have 10 there. Uh -huh. and, and that number could be off a little bit, but in general, that's what I came up with. And so, uh, but I couldn't tell you for sure if there are still Japanese descendants on that island, but they're definitely in turn there during World War II. Okay, thanks. Yep. 
Um, we've had many questions for your about your book, and uh, Julie put a um, a link in the chat uh, if you're interested in uh, having more information. The the book is wonderful. It includes so many of these uh, photographs, and it really brings the the content to life. And so I encourage you all to take a look and, and try to find that book. And if you are a part of the UW system, it is also part of the, our library system. Um, so you can access it through the UW system libraries. Um, there are of course, many, many thank yous. And I wanna uh, wish my thanks, uh, Dr. Jerry Garcia for joining us this evening. Um, it's been a really fabulous conversation uh, I can kind of tell the excitement even through Zoom. I know that we're all in our, our various uh, homes or wherever it is that we're watching, but look, the questions keep coming in and there's so many thank yous. Uh, to let you all know, we will be um, making this recording available on our Clax YouTube channel. And we have two other presentations coming up in our series about the experiences of Japanese and Latin America during World War II and, and Japanese uh, Latin Americans. Um, so I hope you will come back and join us. Dr. Jerry has told us he will try to make it. And so hopefully you'll see him again um, and we'll, we'll be able to have further conversations with insights about experiences from Peru and Brazil. Um, thank you to the audience for such uh, great attention and um, all of your enthusiasm. And thank you again to Dr. Jerry Garcia for joining us. So Natasha, I just put my uh, email address in the chat in case somebody will you want to follow up with any questions, et cetera, you can reach me at uh, zettag54 at gmail.com. Thank you. Okay. So again, uh, I wanna thank uh, Natasha and Julie uh, for, the, for the invite and you know, thank you everybody for showing up. Uh, I know the next two presenters and they're gonna do a fantastic job. So, so come back and listen to additional histories about the Japanese experience in Latin America. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Jerry. That was outstanding. Thank you, Julie, again for your invitation. Wonderful, just... Jerry. We really, it was terrific, really terrific. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for moderating, too, Natasha. You just went, you just went mute. <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you, Julie. You bet. See you everyone. Bye, Margarita. Bye. Bye, Laura. Thank you.